Hello, everyone. We will begin the webinar now. If you're unable to hear us, you can just send us a message on, in the Q&A to the name Miriam Beatty. And here we go. So welcome to today's webinar, Consent and Sexual Assault, a Rights-Based Approach. My name is Clara Longfellow, and I am one of the Girls Action's National Programs Officers. In a couple of minutes, I will be passing the mic to Chrissy from West Coast Lease. We are very fortunate to have her with us today. And I am happy to see some familiar names joining us for today's webinar. For those returning, we warmly welcome you back. And for those of you who are new to our webinar series, I wanted to briefly introduce you to the Girls Action Foundation before passing things along to Chrissy. Very quickly, Girls, the Girls Action Foundation is a national nonprofit that works to empower girls. We are based in Montreal where we run local girls programs and we work with some 250 partners across the country who run their own girls programs. We also provide leadership training, organize networking events, and do other things that connect girls and young women. In terms of impact, nationally we reach about 60,000 girls and young women located in remote, marginalized, and urban communities, including in the north. One of our current projects is called the Building Bridges to Justice Project, and which began in July 2013 and will be continuing until the end of March 2016. The project is funded by Justice Canada, and West Coast Leaf is the legal education partner on the project. The objective of the project is to work with four community organizations to develop resources around what a community of support can look like in response to intimate partner violence among young women. Nearing the end of our project timeline, the next upcoming activities are resource dissemination and regional workshops. Just before introducing Chrissy, I'd like to walk you through the interactive side of today's webinar. You'll see on your screen a number of different information displays and panels that will be changing throughout the presentation. On the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a panel titled Q&A. Here is where you can ask questions and interact with Chrissy, myself, and other participants. If you have a question or comment during the presentation, type it into the Q&A box, hit enter, and it will be recorded there. By default, the question will be visible to everyone. If you would prefer to submit your question privately, click on the down arrow at the bottom of the Q&A box and select my colleague's name, Miriam Zaidi, instead of all participants. The question will then come only to us. During Chrissy's presentation, they will be answering questions from the Q&A box, so feel free to ask your questions as they come. You don't have to save them until the end of the presentation. We will also be taking polls throughout the presentation, and they won't take more than a couple of minutes. I wanted to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded, including the question period. This will be posted online, and I'll send everyone a link to the recording. Finally, at the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up. Please fill it out. We'd love to read your feedback. With that covered, I'd like to introduce Chrissy Arnold. Chrissy is the Education Manager for the feminist legal organization West Coast Lee. She is a feminist, social justice advocate, and firm believer that youth hold the key to a better future. She has over 10 years of experience facilitating transformative educational experiences for youth, both within Canada and internationally. She loves asking questions, drinking coffee, and playing outside. Chrissy is also currently completing her Master's in Educational Studies with a focus on human rights education at UBC. So now we'll pass it over to Chrissy. All right, hi everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you today. I think my presentation, okay, there we go. Um, so as Clara said, my name is Chrissy. I'm the education manager uh, at a small little legal organization on the West Coast uh, called West Coast Leaf. I've been here for about two years. Um, and as she said, my background is in human rights education. And uh, what brought me here was an interest in how to make systemic change um, 
this organization is really based around how to make systemic change, and we use the law to do that. Uh, just before I get started today, I wanted to acknowledge uh, that where I'm coming from, I'm on the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, uh, and grateful to be learning uh, and working with you all here today. Uh, we really think it's important in the context of talking about consent uh, to recognize first that where we are, uh, we are on land that we don't actually have consent to be on, and that's an important thing that we bring in uh, to all of our work and all of our workshops. Um, a little bit about West Coast LEAF. Uh, so as I said, we're a feminist legal organization. We started in the 1980s uh, as a national organization when the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms came into effect. Uh, and there's a provision in there that guarantees the equality of women, and this organization came into, into being to make sure that that provision was made a reality, because as we know, we can have all the rights in the world on paper, um, but if we don't know how to put them into action or we don't have people making sure that they're being put into action, then they don't really mean anything. Um, so there's chapters of LEAF across the country. Uh, there's a national LEAF, which is in Ottawa, and that was where the original one started. Um, but we're actually our own organization, so we have our own staff, our own budget, our own uh, everything out here, but we do have a sort of a partnership, a sister organization in Ottawa. In terms of our work, um, I'll just really briefly go over it. Um, and we have a fancy new website, so if you want to learn more about our work, then you can check us out at westcoastleaf.org. Uh, but we do work in three major areas. So the first is lit litigation, which is just a fancy word for courts. Um, and in that sense, we go to courts to make wider arguments for women's equality. So if something, if a case is going through the courts that we think is going to have a wider impact on the lives of women than the people making the decision might recognize. We would go as what's called an intervener, and so we wouldn't technically take either side, but we would listen to all of the arguments that are happening on both sides, and we would make a submission at the end to say, hey, this is how this is going to affect women's lives in the long run. Uh, the second area of our work is law reform. And we take a community-based research approach uh, to identify policy issues and then make legal recommendations to government based on the outcomes of those. Uh, so recently we just did a project on mothering with disabilities where we worked with mothers uh, that have disabilities across the province to find out uh, what it was like for them to go through the family law system in BC and what kinds of barriers they faced. Uh, and we identified what those were and worked with the women to make policy recommendations based on that. The last area that we work in is public legal education, which uh, is what we're doing today. So we work with both young people and with adults uh, to make them aware of the laws that apply to their lives and the rights that they have in their lives. Uh, with respect to community education and more sort of adult-based learning, uh, we work with uh, community-based organizations and advocates and uh, frontline workers to help people to recognize when their clients are being discriminated against and to help them understand different forms of action that they can take, whether through the legal system or through other uh, government lobbying systems or things like that. Uh, and then our youth programs uh, are what sort of gets me really excited. We have three major youth programs. One is called Youth in the Workplace, uh, where we work uh, to recognize the discrimination that young people face in the workplace, and particularly sex discrimination, and we go over the legislation that protects them. Uh, we have a new workshop called Trend Shift, uh, which looks at issues of um, cyber bullying, as it's been called, but, but saying that there's a gendered lens to this, and that it's actually cyber misogyny, and that women are experiencing um, more being targeted more online uh, than other groups and recognizing this in the context of young people's lives. And then uh, an or <clears throat> a workshop called No Means No, which is what we're mainly going to talk about today. And this is a workshop about sexual assault and consent. And it's really grounding it in conversations about power and violence and stereotypes uh, and gender. And specifically with lots of, of the events that have been in the media in the last uh, couple of months. Unfortunately, this has been something that has been of lots of interest to folks uh, in schools. So we work in schools and in community groups, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that specifically in a minute. 
Uh, so today's topic, we are talking about how to take a rights-based approach to educating youth on issues of sexual assault and consent. Um, as Clara said, this comes out of a partnership that we're doing uh, with the Girls Action Foundation on best practices in educating youth or young women and girls on issues of intimate partner violence, and we're bringing a legal background to the project. So we've been educating uh, and experiencing experiencing, <laughs> we have experience facilitating workshops on consent and sexual assault uh, for almost 15 years. So uh, we're drawing on that expertise and our experience working with young women and girls. Um, we believe that framing the conversation about consent and sexual assault uh, in terms of legal rights is one important aspect of fostering a culture of consent among young people. We recognize that the legal system is fraught with challenges and that uh, in reality it can be um, difficult to access the justice system or overwhelming to access the justice system and that different people have different experiences when they try to access the justice system. Uh, and we do recognize that, um, but we do believe that it's important for young people of all genders to recognize and to understand what the law does say about this issue and to know what their legal rights are. In terms of what we hope to get out of today, um, and we'll hear from you if there's things that you want to get out of today too, uh, it's, it's a bit funny in a webinar format to not be able to have that uh, constant back and forth interaction, um, but sort of what, what we're putting out on the table today uh, is to consider the merits and challenges of a rights-based approach to education about sexual assault and consent to think critically about the interplay of power, violence, and stereotypes on consent and sexual assault, to provide clear legal definitions of consent and sexual assault in Canadian law, and this is an area that uh, there's a lot of misinformation about uh, what does consent actually mean, uh, and so we want to clear that up. Uh, and then to hear from from folks in the group about your experiences working with young women and girls on this issue and to hear really what's coming up in your groups. So I'd like to just start by opening a really quick poll just for one minute, um, just to uh, find out who is here. So if you could include uh, briefly your position and organization, you don't need to put your name, um, and what brought you to this webinar, why you're interested, uh, that would be great, thanks. Okay, great. So it looks like we have folks from uh, sort of all across the map. Well, folks in India as well. That's great. Um, excellent. Okay, thanks for doing that. That helps me to sort of frame uh, where we're going with this. Um, I just want to open another really brief poll while I've got your attention, uh, and we're thinking about a rights-based approach to education, and I just want to think about what that actually means. Um, and so what the questions I'm going to ask you are, are, what are some rights that we all have? So when you think about what are my rights, uh, what comes to mind for you? And then where do those rights come from? So you can think about that as broadly as you want, and there's no wrong answers here. Um, but just what, what, does, what do those two questions mean to you? So I'm going to open that poll briefly now as well. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to take a quick look there. We've got, great. Yeah, so, so many of the, the rights that people spoke about there are what I have written down. So things about um, the right to life, uh, liberty, security of the person, uh, right to expression, right to vote, uh, I see right to consent, right to say no, uh, education, privacy, no discrimination. Uh, and, and some great answers here about where those come from. Um, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, CEDA, which is the Convention of Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, um, comes from international law, uh, the criminal code in terms of keeping us safe. Um, so yeah, there's different, different levels. So there's things that come at the international level uh, that dictate what laws are. Uh, and then really in Canada, our sort of big document is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, and then looking beyond that, we have sort of different human rights codes uh, that define discrimination and just define um, what your rights are in interpersonal relationships um, as well. So there's lots of different places that rights do come from. When we're thinking about the law, I want to sort of frame it in two ways. So um, 
for us, we sort of think there's one one sort of vision of the law that is thinking of it as criminal. And so um, what we think of with criminal law is that it's used as a deterrent. Uh, it's kind of restrictive and closed uh, and and sort of makes a limit on our activity. So you can't do this. Here are things that are illegal for you to do. Uh, and our approach uh, to working with young people and to educating young people um, while it's important for them to know what criminal law exists and what it is illegal for them to do, we like to frame it in a bit more of an expansive way. So we, we take a rights-based approach. Uh, we think of that as sort of more open-ended and, and allowing the possibility for young people to think about how do these apply to my life. Um, so there's sort of less of like, you can't do this, which we know that young people don't necessarily respond very well to, um, and thinking, okay, well, here are my rights as a person, and what would this look like, and how do I respect the rights of other people as well? Um, so I'm going to jump a little bit into uh, our No Means No workshop, and this will be our, our last poll really briefly. Um, but thinking about consent and thinking about rights around consent, um, I want you to start thinking about how you frame conversations about consent in the groups that you work with um, and how that topic comes up. And I'm going to open that poll a little bit later uh, in this workshop, and we might sort of do it towards the end. But I just want that to be sort of going through your mind as we're presenting on the workshop that we do deliver. Uh, so looking at our no means no workshop. It uh, is based in a case called RV and Check. And this was a case in 1999 that happened uh, at the Supreme Court of Canada. It went through two levels of court in Alberta uh, and was appealed and ended up at the Supreme Court. Um, this is really sort of what's known as the no means no case in Canadian law. Um, it was about a young woman who was sexually assaulted at a job interview, um, and the man who was accused said that uh, she didn't say no to, she did say no actually at the beginning, but then he would stop and he would continue to make more um, sort of progressive sexual advances. And at one point she said uh, that she was just too scared and so she stopped saying no. Um, and he said that this implied consent. Um, I would really encourage people uh, if you're working around consent, to take a look at this case. You can Google it, uh, and the actual case from the Supreme Court will come up, and it really gives you a nuanced understanding of how this law came to be. <laughs> that said, I'm going to go through sort of the major pieces of it in this webinar today. Um, the case, really, a lot of the criticism of, of it at the lower levels was that uh, it wasn't even about consent and sexual assault. It was about stereotypes about gender um, and assumptions that were made about how women should present themselves if they don't want to be sexually assaulted, and it is hugely problematic. So some of the uh, comments that came from the justice uh, at the Court of Appeal in Alberta, uh, I'm just going to read a few quotes here. Uh, it should be pointed out that the complainant did not present herself to you and Chuck or enter his trailer, which was where the interview was, in a bonnet and crinolines. Uh, he joked about her innocence in terms of the way that she had presented herself, what she was wearing, um, and said that she was obviously, quote, not lost on her way home from church, end quote. Um, when he dismissed the appeal of the case uh, and and upheld the acquittal of you and Chuck, uh, Justice McClung, McClung described his actions as far less criminal than hormonal uh, and said that uh, rather than going to the police, these kinds of situations are much better dealt with uh, by a well-chosen expletive, a slap in the face, or if necessary, a well-directed knee. So it, it was really problematic the way that the, the case was handled, and then at the Supreme Court of Canada, that was overturned. Um, in terms of our actual workshop, we deliver it to students in grades 5 through 9, um, and it's about three hours in length. Uh, we like to, to work with young people. Grade 5 sometimes seems really young, but we like to work with people as they are starting to negotiate sexual activity for the first time. And we work with uh, kids of all genders, so we think it's important for everybody to know uh, what these laws are, and, and we hear, and I'll talk about what we hear, but that that young people just have no idea what consent is. 
um, or how you get it or that you need to get it. And so it's a really important thing to have that conversation at an early age. Um, the three hours in length is often longer than uh, most workshops that go into schools, and that's because we spend lots of time um, deconstructing things like power and gender and stereotypes um, and thinking about how that plays into what consent actually looks like in our negotiations of sexual activity. Um, our workshops are all peer facilitated and peer being kind of a loose term. Uh, initially when we had developed them it was going to be high school students that were delivering these to younger students. Uh, that was a very difficult thing to coordinate just logistically and so we now have a team of, of youth peer facilitators who are ages about 18 to 24, so generally undergraduate students. Um, and they go into classrooms in groups of two or three with our youth program coordinator and deliver this. We do think it's important for folks to be um, as close in age as possible so that they feel like they're able to talk to someone that they can relate to. Um, our We do a three-day, so 21-hour training for all of our facilitators, so they're really um, well-versed in anti-oppression work uh, and empower and understanding how power and gender um, contribute to different forms of oppression and bring that into conversations about consent. And as I said, we really are working to contextualize uh, the law on sexual assault and consent empower gender and stereotypes. And that's, that's really important for us because we can say, well, this is the law around consent, but if we don't be realistic about what kinds of social expectations there are on young people and, and what they're actually dealing with when they're negotiating sexual activity, then it's going to become pretty meaningless, we believe. Um, so we want to be realistic about what the situations are that they're facing um, and talk about how you would negotiate consent in those situations and how you would make sure that you know that the other person wants to be there in those situations. Um, I'm really grounding it in a wider systemic conversation about discrimination. So looking at, at what the actual workshop entails, I'm just going to really briefly go through it and then we're going to get into what the actual legal definitions are of consent and sexual assault. Uh, and then I'm going to speak briefly about some of the responses that we hear from young people. Um, and that will be pretty much all of our time and then I'd love to hear from you again with that poll question about how uh, consent comes up in conversations in your own work. So we begin with a conversation about um, power and violence and what that looks like. And we do generally just sort of like a big group brainstorm about it. Um, we talk about who has power in society, um, who in their lives has power, uh, and then what violence looks like. And usually it in, in the young people's minds, it looks like punching and kicking and every different kind of um, different physical aspect of violence that you could imagine. And so we generally have to sort of lead them into, well, what could other violence look like? Um, and talking about sexual violence or talking about emotional violence, talking about um, different forms of violence and how, how we might experience those in our peer groups or in relationships. We then break down concepts of gender and sex because what we're talking about a lot is uh, stereotypes that have to do uh, with gender and how those interact or come into our relationships with each other and how we negotiate sexual activity. Um, and so we we start by talking about sex and that being sort of the parts that you're born with and what's between your legs. And then we talk about gender and that being how you express yourself to the world um, and what you identify with and sort of what's in your, what's between your ears and your head. Uh, we do an activity then where we look at gender stereotypes in the media. Um, and traditionally this has been looking through magazines and just saying like, let's notice what different kinds of things girls and guys are doing in the magazines. And, and it's amazing, I'm sure many of you have done activities like this or done them with kids, but uh, just to see sort of their eyes light up as they start to realize um, how, how people are portrayed in the media and what kinds of roles people have um, and, and people start to get mad about it and we think that's great. <laughs> Um, and then we, we sort of transition from looking at the media to thinking about our own lives. And so what are the gender stereotypes that happen in your own life? How are you expected to act in your own life? Um, 
and and then specifically we sort of put this conversation towards um, in relationships. So what are girls expected to do in relationships? What are guys expected to do in relationships? How are you expected to act? And then also what happens, like what are the consequences if you don't act in line with those social expectations? And just sort of laying that all out there so that people can start to talk about it and we can start to break down these assumptions about how we're supposed to act and where they come from and why they exist. Then what we do um, is we get into a conversation about from relationships about consent and we, we sort of launch right into what are the legal definitions. So we ask them if they know what consent is uh, and depending on the age they have different understandings of what it is. Um, and then we go through really basic definitions that hold in Canada and these are what the legal definitions are. So I'm just going to go through these briefly with you guys. So consent, a person cannot give consent if they are being forced to participate, if they are incapable of consenting, or if they are afraid of the person who is asking them to consent. The Supreme Court of Canada has ruled that silence is not consent. And the courts have decided that it is the responsibility of each of us to make sure that the other person has freely given clear consent before initiating sexual contact. This means that it is the responsibility of each of us to make sure our partners are able to consent, that we know they are over 16 or fall under the close in age exception, that they are not drunk or stoned, and that they know and understand what they are agreeing to. So we kind of break that down then and we put it out to the group and say, okay, so what would a situation be where a person um, cannot give consent? And so we talk about uh, if they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol, that they wouldn't be able to necessarily give consent. If they're asleep, they wouldn't be able to give consent. Or if they were passed out or unconscious, they wouldn't be able to give consent. Uh, and, we, and we see if there's anything else that can come out of the group in terms of situations where you cannot give consent. Um, one that, that is sometimes surprising to young people is talking about the age of consent and the fact that you cannot give consent uh, if you do not fall within a close in age exception or you're not over 16. So we ask them what they think the age of consent is and there's often a lot of misinformation about this. Um, so 16 in Canada is the age of consent. Once you're 16, you can consent to sexual activity. There's one uh, exception to that once you're 16, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then the close in age exceptions are that if you're 12 or 13 years old, you can consent to sexual activity with someone who's less than two years older than you. And if you're 14 or 15 years old, you can consent to sexual activity with someone that's less than five years older than you. Um, the situation where if you're over 16 you still can't consent is that uh, until you're 18 you cannot consent to sexual activity with somebody that is in a, a position of authority. So whether that was uh, a coach or a teacher or a babysitter, uh, somebody that has some kind of authority over you, uh, it would be seen as exploitative uh, and as well uh, things like sex work or engaging in things like pornography are illegal until you're 18. Um, it's also important uh, for us to talk about being forced to participate and the kinds of situations you might find yourself uh, when you be forced to participate. Um, sometimes we talk about things like if uh, someone was threatening to withhold food from you or shelter or things like that, uh, a parent or a family member, um, that that would be forced and then even if you said yes in that situation, it wouldn't be consensual in the courts. Um, and then finally, that silence is not consent. And so that even if you don't say no, and I know people in this group would know this, um, you have to say yes or give the cue that you are uh, willing and wanting to be involved in that sexual activity and the fact that you can stop at any time. Uh, just because you consent to one thing doesn't mean you consent to everything. So that's the definition of consent, and uh, if there's questions around that, then we'll take them up sort of in the end here. Uh, and then we look at the definition of uh, sexual assault. And so sexual assault is defined as forcing someone to participate in sexual activities without their permission or their consent. 
It is a sexual assault to sexually touch any part of another person's body without their consent. And then we talk about a conviction for sexual assault, which requires proof of the following. Sexual contact or touching, the intention to sexually touch a person, no consent, deliberately ignoring the fact that no consent has been given. So we go through those definitions and we make sure that there's a good understanding of what they mean. Um, and then we try to bring it sort of into real life with a scenario. And so what we do is as a group, uh, we read through a scenario and I'm not gonna read through the whole thing right now in the interest of time. Um, but the first one that we look at is a young woman who's home alone. Uh, and a friend comes by and she brings two young men with her from school uh, and they bring alcohol. And the girl whose house it is feels nervous and unsure about what to do, but she decides to let her friends in and they all start drinking. The young woman whose house it is has a pool and there's a decision amongst the group that they're gonna go swimming. Um, so she lets everyone know that she's gonna go change and a young man, Andrew, comes into the bathroom while she's changing. At first she yells, get out of here, um, but he continues to come in and uh, begins to touch her and kiss her uh, without her consent. And at that point, she doesn't say anything. She just starts crying. Um, and eventually, he leaves. So we break up young people uh, after this into small groups, and we distribute discussion questions to them to have small discussions in their groups, which they'll then bring back to the bigger group. And we ask them to reflect on a few things, how they felt listening to the story, how you think Anna, who's the girl whose house it is, felt, what thoughts might have been running through her mind at different points. And so the different points that we ask are when she let everybody into the house, when Andrew came into the bathroom, when he was touching her, after he left, and later that night. And then we bring it back to the group and we sort of have a wider group discussion uh, about what they think about this scenario. And we do think it's important for them to have a brief discussion amongst themselves before bringing it to the group with the facilitators um, because their assumptions really come out in those small group discussions uh, and then it's a good time to sort of get into them and prod at them when they come back to the group. So just some of the common responses uh, that we hear from young people and the, the myths that come up. Um, a big one is that consent is like a domino effect. So if I make one bad decision, the cascade of bad things that might happen as a result of that bad decision are my fault. Um, and they talk a lot about this in terms of um, things like, well, she let, she would think, why did I let this happen? Why didn't I stop it? And then, well, what will my parents do if they find out what should I do? Uh, why did I let them in? It's my fault because I let them in. Uh, should I tell my parents? I'm feeling ashamed of what happened. Um, people were drinking. I'm going to get in trouble for people having been drinking. Um, and so this sort of sense of victim blaming on her uh, around that issue and then also around sort of smaller things like the fact that young people are always like, well, why didn't she lock the door? She was sort of like letting him come in or why didn't she scream no? Why didn't her friend protect her? Um, and so there's a real onus of responsibility that gets put on the girl in this situation, which is not surprising, but is really important for us to pull out um, and then to ask questions about that. Um, it also comes up in terms of responsibility around drug and alcohol use. So the idea that, well, if they're drinking, um, then it's no longer your responsibility. Uh, and if something bad happens to you in terms of sexual activity, then that's your fault because you were drinking. Um, and so it's really important to bring that out and, and to ask questions about that and what that really means. Um, the other major myth that comes out of this is that sexual assault is limited to forced intercourse uh, and or being slip drugs. So that's sort of the narrative that young people get told or that they have in their head uh, and sort of bringing it into that the most often <clears throat> sexual assault is happening with people that you know. Um, and, and this idea of forced intercourse so that because in this, this particular situation, after she said no, she stopped resisting and she didn't physically resist him. Um, people take that 
uh, young people take that to mean that she wanted to go ahead with it or that she was okay with it. And and so talking about this idea of silence as not being consent um, and that you don't have to physically resist something to not want to do it. Um, so so that sort of like really debunking those and then talking about, okay, well, what does consent look like? And what we often hear from young people is like, that's so awkward. I, I'm not going to like, if we're going to make out, then I'm not going to say, is it okay if we make out? Um, and we really push them to think about what, what that means in relationships and um, the way that we communicate with our partners in relationships and saying like, yeah, it might feel awkward at first and this might not be something that you're used to doing, but it's what you need to do to make sure um, that you are getting consent from the other party or parties. Um, we then go into one more brief scenario and I'm gonna sort of wrap up in a second, so I'm just gonna speak very briefly about it. Um, but we want to make sure that we recognize that sexual assault can happen to everyone. Um, and we give a scenario about a young guy in grade nine who's just moved to a new city and a new school, um, and he goes to a party. And when he's sort of just outside getting some air because he's overwhelmed and doesn't know anybody at the party, uh, a girl in grade 12 comes up to him and gropes him and attempts, attempts to kiss him. Um, and he indicates that he's not interested and doesn't consent. Uh, and the response from the young woman is to ask him if he's gay or something and walk out of the room. And and we use this scenario to uh, talk about the idea that uh, there's an assumption that men are always interested in sexual activity um, and that they should always be interested in sexual activity. And so we want to make sure that it's clear that that um, is not the case. And And this is something that's like, girls at that age often just haven't thought about. Um, so so we bring that up in the conversation. So that's sort of like how we how we approach it. And then at the end of it, we, we have a little quiz that we give um, of all kinds of different situations um, where consent isn't being given, but that you might make an assumption that consent has been given. Um, and so we go through that with the class and we make sure that they know that all these different situations where maybe someone's been silent or someone's not sure or somebody has started engaging in sexual activity but wants to stop, that none of those are consensual um, and and that the only time it is consensual is that when there is um, willing participation from all members that are involved in the activity. So that's sort of where we're at and I'm going to open it up. Uh, for discussion. I'm going to open that poll briefly um, and ask that you sort of give us a sense of, of when, how consent comes up in the work that you do with young women and girls um, and how you approach it with them and how you approach the topic. We're looking to learn from you as well. Um, and then if you have any questions, I think you can direct them uh, to Clara and she will direct them to me. So I'm going to open that poll now. Okay, great. I am going to um, have a look at these answers here and, and in the meantime pass uh, the microphone over to Clara. Uh, if you didn't have time to answer in that period, uh, then you can write it in the Q&A. I think we have about 10 minutes uh, to have a conversation here. So I'll pass it over to you, Clara. Oh, sorry. So we have a question here from Emily, and she is asking, how does the topic of consent get framed in your workshop on cyber misogyny? And do you give a specific scenarios there as well? As she finds that the legal precedent is so lacking that a rights-based approach is perhaps more challenging when discussing cyber violence. Okay. Yeah, in, in our cyber misogyny workshop, um, it it's difficult <laughs> to talk about uh, what consent looks like. Um, we definitely bring it into uh, the context of the workshop about um, how we share things online and how we um, agree to things online and that just, again, because we agree to one thing, uh, doesn't mean we agree to others. In terms of a rights-based approach, 
Uh, it's certainly more challenging due to that lack of precedent. Um, what we're seeing right now with C-13, the bill going through, uh, that will at least make it illegal to share uh, non-consensual, non-consensually share sexually explicit images, um, is that hopefully that's going to have some kind of ripple effect. That's technically a law for people over the age of 18, um, but it, um, it, it's likely that that might ripple down to people under the age of 18 in terms of them interacting with their peers. Uh, right now, uh, when we talk about sharing things without consent uh, for people under 18, uh, we, actually, we have a good infographic on our, on our website in the educational resources section about child pornography law, and we don't think that that is a good way for young people um, that they, we don't think they should be prosecuted under child pornography if it's peer-to-peer -peer sharing, um, but that is actually uh, where the law has been for the last while. Uh, so if you are sharing an image of somebody um, that is sexually explicit in nature and you're under 18 and the person in the image is under 18, uh, then it would be captured by child pornography laws. And that has huge repercussions. Uh, you can be put on the sex offender registry uh, for doing that. And we think it's important for young people to know that. Um, and, and outside of an image that was created together and kept only between the two people, that's where um, the law would come into play. So we do want to make young people aware of that. Um, if we're talking about over 18, it is a bit different uh, until until sort of now there's been absolutely nothing to ban um, to ban the non-consensual sharing of images, which is quite astounding. Um, so we'll see sort of what happens now, uh, and it's hard to say what that's going to look like. Thank you, Chrissy. So we have another question here from Ariane, who is looking for suggestions on activities beyond scenarios to help youth understand what consent or lack thereof looks like in real life and how to make that connection to from consent laws to their lives. To their lives. That's a great question, and I would sort of open that up um, to the group. Uh, my major experience is in using scenarios. Um, I, I mean, I can think of, of things that would be really effective in terms of um, potentially using some things like theater of the oppressed. Um, and so having situations where where things are presented and then having people intervene to say, no, that that's not how this should look. It should look this way. Um, in my own experience on doing this kind of educational work and specifically around consent, because we want to stay really focused and we don't have a ton of time, like we're not working over a, over a period of 12 weeks with a group of girls, which might be a different context than uh, some other folks are. Uh, we keep it pretty focused, um, but I would definitely sort of, I don't know if we can open that up to the group or um, I know the folks at Metrac in Toronto, they might be a good place to look uh, or to speak to folks there because um, I know they're doing uh, workshops around similar issues. Uh, Sorry, I don't have a, a better specific answer for you at this time. Um, so we have two more questions here. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps we could go to the, a discussion of the results from the last poll that you... Great. Okay. So how do you respond... This is a question from Lois. How do you respond to young women questioning the law in action after decisions that acquit men of sexual assault? when, for example, the woman was drunk. So what is really the law of consent in practice? Yeah, that's a really challenging one. And, and as I said um, at the beginning of the workshop that we do this work with a recognition of um, the fact that it doesn't always play out in court the way we it often doesn't play out in court the way we would want it to or in the justice system. Um, it's it's difficult to give a specific answer in that it's so dependent on the facts that are presented in a case and the specific evidence that would be in a case. So giving um, 
a generalized answer as to, you know, why was the young man acquitted uh, in this situation, uh, it would really it would really depend on what specifically has happened in that case. Again, as I mentioned with um, the Ewan Chuck case, it, I would recommend sort of going to read that if you haven't. It's not super difficult to read and just to get an understanding of sort of the kinds of conversations that are happening between judges um, and the kinds of things that they're taking into account um, to sort of be able to wrap your head around that. Um, I, we are quite careful not to jump into the specifics of one specific case when people bring them up um, or like generalized questions about, oh, if somebody was drunk um, and say, this is the law and, and from like a rights-based perspective or from the perspective of how they are going to um, moderate their own behavior, it's really important for them to know that for them to be acting legally, they have to um, get consent and get active and willing consent. Um, and that, and the piece on the acquittals is a really big challenge, and um, I can't really give a specific answer on that. Uh, it would really depend on case by case, and I know that that is kind of an unsatisfying answer, but it's it's a real challenge, and we recognize that it's a challenge in court, but we do think part of this is fostering this culture of consent at a young age um, so that as people are going through and deciding how they're going to navigate sexual activity, they know what they need to do. Okay. So we have five minutes left. So mm -hmm. we'll take uh, this one last question and then go to the poll. Great. So this is a, a question from Taryn. And they were wondering about your thoughts on the recent announcement that Ontario is going to include consent in their sexual education curriculum. As often they find that they are discouraged when speaking with high school students that they have already internalized myths and stereotypes. Yeah. Um, I think it's great. <laughs> um, I think uh, it should be part of, of every curriculum, um, sex education, any kind of education. You know, we, we see lots of things uh, now with, with people looking at how do we talk about consent uh, from a really young age? Uh, how do we teach young people that uh, their body is theirs and that they get to do what they want with it? And so whether that's with, um, you know, a three-year-old and asking them if it's okay to give them a hug or if they want a hug, um, and not making assumptions about what they want to do with their body um, all the way through to high school students and talking about sexual activity. So I think it's such an important thing. Um, and and whether high school is too late per se, um, I don't think it's ever too late to start having these conversations. I think we can push to um, be having these conversations in schools when students are younger. And so the earlier that we can get them in, uh, the better, but getting them in at all is, is just so, so important. Um, and, and we think, you know, having a, a sex positive approach to consent um, and talking about uh, consent and sexual assault is just so much more likely to resonate with young people and to get through to them and say, this is, we recognize the reality of your lives and, and this is what you need to know. Um, so I think that it's fantastic that it's getting in there, and I hope that it will continue to be brought in earlier and earlier in different forms of education um, before we're even necessarily talking about sex, but just talking about our bodies. Yeah, thank you for your responses to the questions, Chrissy. Did you want to go over the results from the poll? Yeah, we have a few. Um, it's uh we all, we had about five answers that we got in in time here um but just sort of we're hearing uh organizations running consent campaigns on university campuses um both in during frosh week and valentine's day and so um having sort of information to share uh in that context and i think even there is a really important place to be able to give like real sort of legal information about this is what it looks like and this is how how we need to negotiate it and to to recognize again that piece around um 
gendered expectations? Like, how do you bring that, as there's my question, into conversations with first year students uh, during frost, frost week, right? Like, like, what are the expectations that you are going to have on you as a young woman entering university for the first time? And, and I think for girls to be able to say, okay, like, these are the sort of social pressures that are on me and this, it's okay that I, that I feel those social pressures and I can still make the decisions for myself um, in that context and those don't need to dictate the decisions that I make. Um, I'm seeing here uh, things about talking about consent online with youth, making an educational poster. We're about to release an infographic on consent and sexual assault, so I'll just put that out there. Once we have it, we'll um, make that available if you follow us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, it should be in the next sort of month or so. Um, in terms of like dealing with girls groups and situations in the media um, and and the Gian Gameshi case, um, I think these are really important moments. Um, I would say with like the Gian Gameshi case, it's, it's not actually a very unique uh, situation other than the fact that he was a public figure and that it's come out so publicly. Um, so these moments when they're is a national conversation happening and people are willing to talk about it and people are asking questions, I think um, are great moments to have those conversations and to ask young people what they think about it. Um, and, and that's always my approach is, you know, if, if they have an assumption um, about things, then then asking them where that comes from and asking them to sort of really reflect on that rather than shutting them down. Um, they can usually come to really insightful um, sort of ideas and recognition of, of where their assumptions come from if we give them the space to do that. So um, I would just say let's keep keep asking questions and, and use those moments and then use the moments where it's not in the media too to make sure that the conversation is ongoing. Um, yeah, maybe we'll leave it there. It's 11 o'clock <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> or 2 o'clock for you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chrissy. Yes, these are really important discussions to be having, and we really appreciate your presentation in making consent and sexual assault within a legal framework and a rights-based approach very accessible. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so that is all the time that we have for our presentation today. And for those of you who would like to share this webinar with others, a link to the full presentation and question period will be available online in the next few days. And we will be sending you a link on where to find it. And we would also like to ask you for your feedback on today's presentation. Once you leave this window, a pop-up window will appear with a very short survey. We would really appreciate you taking the time to fill it out, and as this is a way to help us continue to improve the webinar experience for participants. So to find out more from our resources, you can find the Girls Action Amplify Toolkit online and our other publications and online resources on our website. And to find out more about webinars, you can also find that on our website. And thank you so much for attending and for being with us today. And thank you for filling out our survey. Have a great day, everyone. And thanks again to Chrissy Arnold from West Coast Police.